All right. Well, hey, if you have your Bible, if you have a, a phone or an iPad or whatever you have, open to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Didn't, um, for those of you that were here last week, didn't Pastor Jose do a great job in his message? Did absolutely fantastic. I want you to know, I am, um, I'm so proud of our church for many different reasons, and, and uh, this fall you're going to hear of some of the fantastic ways that we are involved in our community, partnering with the city of Hollywood, partnering with churches in Hollywood to make a difference in our community, and we're doing that. So I'm so proud of many things that happen here, but I could not be more proud of our pastoral team and the team that God has given us, these guys that stand up and faithfully preach God's word, they do a fantastic job. And I want you to know as a congregation how proud I am to minister alongside of them, and I have full confidence in them. And every time they stand up here, they do a phenomenal job, and, and I'm thankful, so thankful for the team that God has given to us. Well, for those of you who know me and most of you know me well, or, or pretty well, I would think. Uh, you, would, you, you would agree that I'm a pretty active person. Uh, yeah, some of you are giggling, right? Um, I, I've, been, I've been accused of being hyperactive at times, all right? Um, I have a tendency, especially if you see me on, on, on Sunday morning, I'm kind of running all over the place, running from one place to another, and I, I agree, I'm, uh, I'm really active. I always have to be doing something. As a matter of fact, it is, it is difficult for me just to sit and do nothing. That goes against my nature. I admire people who can sit and just think for long periods of time. That's just not me. As a matter of fact, if, if you ever want to punish me, here's the best way to punish me. Put me in a room, sit me in a chair, and, uh, and don't give me a book, a television, or a computer, or anything. Tell me just to sit there and think, all right? If you want to punish me, that's the, that's the way to punish me. And I'm telling you right now, after about 10 or 15 minutes, you better come and check on me because I'm probably going crazy in the room. That's just not me. I'm always kind of this nervous, energetic, got to be doing something type of guy. That's why the truth of today's message is very difficult for me. And I want to be honest and transparent God's kind of beat me up over this passage this week. Not only in my own study and my own preparation, but just a few moments ago, I, I spoke in our Spanish ministry, spoke this message in our Spanish ministry, and out of the 70 or 80 people there, I don't think there was anyone more convicted than me. So I want you to know that today's message, if it accomplishes anything, God's using it in my life. And I trust that he uses it in your life as well. You see, in John chapter 15, our, our, our passage today, there is no command to action. That's tough for somebody like me who always wants action. There is no command for action. There is no strategy for building a church. There is no plan for evangelizing the world. In John 15, there is one simple command, a command that is very easy to go unnoticed, a command in our busy culture that is extremely easy to go unheeded. And for those of us who are task-oriented people, it's easy for us to bounce beyond what Jesus tells us in John chapter 15 and move on to another more action-based command and miss the truth, the deep, life-changing truth that Jesus gives us in these verses. So notice with me in John chapter 15, I'm just going to read the first eight verses. Would you um, listen not only with your ears today, but would you listen with your heart and allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to you. Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my Father 
is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into a fire and burned. But if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Would you pray with me today? Lord, today we, we come to you with, um, with busy hearts. We come to you today with busy lives. No doubt most of us already have plans this afternoon and maybe tonight and our week is already planned as we have much to do and much to accomplish. It's difficult for us to plan time in our lives for you. And if we're not careful, it's easy for us to live our lives independently of you, even though we would never admit to doing that, it's easy for us to live day after day separated from you. I pray, Lord, as we look at these verses today that you would bring the truth home to our lives. Help us not to think about how this applies to somebody else, but help us to be honest with ourselves and think about how this applies to us. Speak to our hearts today. Help us to see the importance of being connected to the vine. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In John chapter 15, we find uh, a spiritual metaphor. Let me take you back to high school English. Remember what a metaphor is? Uh, just so you know, I didn't do well in high school English. I didn't do well in college English either. I, I took it twice, not because I wanted to, not because I had to. And so grammar is not one of my strengths. But if you'll remember back to high school English, a metaphor is a figure of speech that is used to make a comparison between two things that aren't alike but have something in common. We use metaphors all the time in our language. Let me give you uh, some illustrations. Time is money. How many of us have sped that? Now, we know time is not really money, but time, like money, which easily slips through our fingers, time is like money because it slips through our fingers just as easily. That classroom is a zoo, some parents have said, or maybe some teachers have said about their classrooms. We know it's not really a zoo, but we know it's like a zoo when you walk in. Life is a roller coaster. We've said that. Now, life's not really a roller coaster, but life, like a roller coaster, is filled with ups and downs, right? So, so we use metaphors on a regular basis as we talk about our life. Well, in John chapter 15, we not only find one metaphor, but we actually find three metaphors that applies to us. Because first of all, Jesus says that he is the vine Metaphor number one, that God the Father is the vine dresser, the husbandman, he's the Father, and that we are the branches. Three metaphors that Jesus uses to explain a profound truth to us. The most important one is found in the very beginning of the chapter where Jesus says this, I am the true vine. As we walk through the Gospel of John, we've seen many of those I am statements. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door. I am the light. I am the good shepherd. This is the last of Jesus' I am statements. And Jesus doesn't just say that he is a vine. 
He doesn't just say that he is the vine, but Jesus tells us that he is the true vine. Jesus there is contrasting himself with the nation of Israel who repeatedly throughout the Old Testament was characterized as the vine of God. Isaiah chapter 5, in different places, God calls Israel his vine. But the simple truth is that Israel never fulfilled its responsibility as the vine. So now Jesus comes upon the scene, and Israel already understanding that they had been called the vine of God, Jesus comes on the scene, and in front of all of these religious leaders, he says, I am not just the vine, he says, but I am the true vine. And Jesus is intentionally contrasting himself with the nation of Israel. And his hearers, it might not be as clear for us in this day and age, but Jesus' hearers would immediately have caught on what he was doing. Because what Jesus was doing was he was identifying himself as the Messiah. He was identifying himself as the fulfillment of the Old Testament covenants. He was coming with a specific purpose. So so as we read this, and Jesus says, okay, I'm the vine, Father's the vine dresser, you are the branches, you and I have one very simple and clear-cut response to the vine. He simply tells us, abide. Abide. Abide in the vine. You'll notice, and if you're like me, I'm, I'm a counter, all right? So the word abide is found 10 times from verses 4 through 10. Over and over again in that short period of time, he talks about, he commands us to abide, and then he, he explains what that means, and then he gives us the benefits of abiding in him, and then he gives us the dangers of not abiding in him. The word abide probably isn't a word that we use very often. The word abide simply means to stay. It means to remain. Um, If you said, Brian, what are you going to do this afternoon? Vicki and I have really important plans today. I'm abiding on my couch all afternoon, all right? (laughs) So so I'm going to go home, eat something, probably turn on a golf match, lay down on my couch, and abide there for about three or four hours. Don't call me because I'm not leaving, all right? I'm going to abide. I am going to remain right there. But the word abide here doesn't just mean to remain, to stay in one place. It has a little bit more of a profound implication. The, the, The word literally means to be connected. To, to, to maintain that connection with. And so here's what Jesus is saying. Our responsibility, and if you understand one truth that I'm going to say all day long, and I'm going to say it over and over again, and I'm going to say it at the end. Our responsibility, our number one responsibility as followers of Jesus Christ is to stay connected to the vine. Let me say that again. Our number one responsibility is to stay connected to the vine. We don't do a very good job of that. You see, in our life, heartache, spiritual weakness, and sin are all the result of us disconnecting ourselves from the vine. We can can give all kinds of excuses as to why we do the things we do and why we fall into the sins that we fall into and why we don't have the spiritual strength that we should and why we're not doing what God wants us to do. But the simple truth is that the heartaches that we experience, the struggles that we go through, the sin that constantly seems to creep into our lives, all of those things are the direct result of disconnecting ourselves from the vine. The contrast of that is that contentment, peace, joy, satisfaction, and fulfillment are all products of staying connected to the vine. 
The simple truth is that the more disconnected we are, the more problems we will have. And, and, and by problems, I don't want you to think that when you're connected to the vine, you're not going to have any problems. I'm talking about problems living a life that honors and glorifies God. The more connected we are, even though problems in life may come, even though tragedy happens, the more connected we are to the vine, the more joyful we are, the more contented we are, the more satisfied we are, because we remain connected to the vine. So the question very simply for us this morning is this, what does it mean to be connected to the vine? Even more simply, what does it mean to be connected to Jesus? And this is where God has spoken to me all week long. Let me share you three simple truths and we'll whittle it down to one point at the end. The first thing that I wrote in my notes is this, to be connected to the vine means that you have everything you need in Jesus. Please let that truth sink into your mind and your heart. To be connected to the vine means that you have everything. Say the word everything with me today. Everything. To be connected to the vine means that you have everything you need in Jesus. Let me show you a simple picture. I didn't draw this. This is a simple picture of a vine. You see there's the vine there, and you can see the branch that comes off of the vine, are you with me? And then you can see the fruit that's dangling from the branch. We all see the picture. Can you keep that up there for just a little bit? So, 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 so here's what's taking place. The vine sprouts from the roots. We get that. We don't need an agricultural class. The vine sprouts from the roots. The branches are connected to the vine. And the fruit grows from the the branches. Do we understand that? We all get that, right? As a matter of fact, we could sing today. Why don't you sing with me today? The fruit is connected to the branches. The branches are connected to the vine. Come on, I couldn't get you to participate. Listen, of all the things you're going to remember today, that's what you're going to remember. What did Brian speak about today? I don't know, he sang some stupid song about being connected to, to, uh, to the vine and all of that. You get it. Listen, what happens when you cut off the branch from the vine? It dies, right? Now, now, now I know when are you going to come with me afterwards and say, no, Brian, you can cut that off, you can place it in water, and you can place it in the ground, that's going to grow again. I get all of that, all right? So please, please don't try to come up and, and teach me a plant lesson afterward, all right? I get that. For the most part, though, when you cut off the branch from the vine, the branch dies. The branch cannot survive on its own. We understand that. The branch needs the vine in order to survive. Why is that? Because it is the vine and the vine alone that has everything that the branch needs to live, to flourish and to produce fruits. That's what Jesus is talking about. Look at verse 4 once again. Jesus says, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And verse 5, he says it even more succinctly. He says, apart from me, cut off from me, you can't do anything. You can do nothing. Pretty direct, is it not? But you know what's happened to us? You know what's happened to me? And if I can be a little precocious, what's happened to you too? In many cases, we have learned to live apart from his presence. We've learned to live apart from his nourishment. We've learned to live apart from his empowerment. It's not that we don't know that we need it, but man, life is busy. You wake up in the morning, you hit that snooze three times, you want to get up, but man, in the morning you just don't have any energy, and you hit the snooze, and you hit it again, and you hit it again, and all of a sudden you got what? You got 15 minutes to get dressed and walk out the door. 
And so you're racing out of the door, you know, tucking your shirt in with a cup of coffee, and you hit the traffic, and you're in traffic, and you're in a busy day all day long, and then after work, man, you got to pick up the kids, and, and you got to eat supper, and life is a rat race. And we sit back and we say, man, wouldn't it be great if I had time for Jesus? Oh, Lord, help us. What we're literally saying is, I think I can make it separated from the vine. I think I can do it on my own. And what happens is, we live, we are satisfied with a meager, with a dry, with an un productive life and we live that way day after day week after week month after month are we Christians yes we're Christians do we claim to be followers of Jesus yes we claim to be followers of Jesus but we struggle with the same sins over and over and over again we struggle with joy we struggle with satisfaction our life has very little power. We're producing very little fruit. And we sit back and ask ourselves, is this all that there is to the Christian life? And the problem is not with the vine. The problem is with us who are the branches. Bud McCord, who pastored here for years, has written a book called The Satisfying Life out of John chapter 15. I read it again this week. I'd encourage you to read it. But, but he uses an illustration. I've adapted it a bit, but follow the illustration. He talks about a young man that was desperate to get away. A young man that desperately wanted to take a vacation, that wanted to escape, that wanted to take a cruise. And for months, this young man saved every penny that he could. He not only wanted to take a cruise, he wanted to take one of the best cruises. And he saved, and he saved, and he scraped, and he pulled all of his money together in order to take this cruise. And finally, the day had come where he had made enough money. And so he went to the cruise lines, and, and he purchased his luxury ticket for this vacation. And the day comes when it's time for him to leave and he packs his bags and he's heading out the door towards the port, towards the cruise ship. And he remembers in his mind, oh my mind, oh my word, I didn't pack anything to eat. And so on, on the way to the port, he stops at the grocery store and he buys four loaves of bread and two jars of peanut butter. And he enters the luxury cruise ship for the, for, the, for the vacation of his life. And he's ready. And during the day, he goes out and he experiences all the things that the ship has to offer. But at mealtimes, he would go back to his cabin, pull out the loaf of bread, and make himself a peanut butter sandwich and eat a peanut butter sandwich. Morning, noon, night, after a couple of days, some of the passengers noticed what he was doing and said, why don't you come and, and eat with us? We're eating at this restaurant or we're eating over here. No, 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 I'm fine. And one of the crew members even noticed what he was doing and said, listen, why don't you, why don't you come and eat at one of the, no, 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 I'm fine. Day after day, he enjoyed some of the luxuries of the ship, but he would go back to the privacy of his cabin and he ate peanut butter sandwiches for breakfast, peanut butter sandwiches for lunch, and peanut butter sandwiches for dinner. On the last day of the cruise, he'd run out of bread and he ran out of peanut butter and so he emerges from his cabin hungry and depressed. A crew member sees him and asks him why he had eaten all of his meals in the cabin and not taking advantage of some of the excellent restaurants that the cruise ship had provided. He confessed that he didn't have any money and he was embarrassed to ask for help. The crew member then looks at him and says, but sir, everything was included in the price of your tickets. You could have eaten at any restaurants. Why, you could have eaten in all of the restaurants. You could have eaten anything you wanted because everything was provided for you. I'm sure you get the application. But he says this, in Jesus 
We have everything we need. You see, when he gave us our passage, when he gave us our ticket to the cruise liner, which is called Jesus, it was an all-inclusive ticket. And he looks at you and I each and every day, and he says, I have everything you need. I have more than you need. I can satisfy all of your needs and more. But we, whether it's ignorance, whether it's apathy, we make our way back to our little cabin and we eat our spiritual peanut butter sandwiches. By the way, I love peanut butter sandwiches, so I'm not, I'm not knocking peanut butter sandwiches. We eat our peanut butter sandwiches when God has a banquet ready for us. And we fail to take advantage of it. Notice this verse, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Peter says, his divine power has granted to us all things. Repeat with me, all things. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Church, get this today. Because Jesus lives in you, because you are a child of God, because you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, all of God's divine perfections are at our disposal. He in us has everything that we need. So I ask you this morning, are you weak? No problem. He's all powerful. Are you here today and you're troubled? No problem. He is peace. Are you here today and you're fearful about being defeated or you're fearful about the future? That doesn't matter. Look to Jesus. He is your victory. Are you discouraged? Look to him. He will give you joy. As a matter of fact, if you look at this passage in three different verses, he, he lays it out for us. Notice verse 7. Here's what he says in verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. He says, listen, if you are close to me and you're, and you're abiding in me and we're right there, man, we are, we are buddy buddies. Listen, you ask whatever you want and you can sit back and say, really, man? Here's what I'm going to ask for. Listen, if you're abiding in him, he's going to change your desires and your wants to be like his. And he said, you ask whatever you want and I will give it to you. We get our prayers answered. But notice verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. You want to be loved? Abide in him. Verse 11, these things have I spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Remember, don't forget what Jose preached about last week. The disciples had just gone through a period where their minds were troubled. Jesus says, I am leaving you. One of them was going to betray him. There was an uncertain future. And, then, and now Jesus looks at them and says, even though I'm leaving, even though your heart is troubled, even though you don't know what the future is, I want my joy to be in you, that your joy may be full. So here's what Jesus says. Abiding in me, staying connected to the vine, means that in Jesus, I have everything I need. Whatever you're struggling with today, and I'm looking at a congregation of people that have struggles. You say, Brian, how do you know that? Because I have struggles. I have burdens on my heart today. Whatever it is on your heart Jesus has the answer for you. And not only does he have the answer for you, he is living in you and he is with you and all of his divine attributes are available 
to you. Why is that? Because he's the vine and you're connected to the vine. To be connected to the vine means that in Jesus we have everything we need. Let me show you a second thing. To be connected to the vine means that you will produce fruits. To be connected to the vine means that you will produce fruit. Think with me today, in a vineyard, fruitfulness is not a luxury. Fruitfulness is a necessity. Did you ever, did you ever would you ever hear a vineyard owner, owner that would take you out to his vineyard and say, and show you acres and acres of vines and say, look at all of these beautiful vines. And you would ask him, as I would, Man, how much fruit, how much, how many grapes, how much wine is being produced from these vines? If he looked at you and said, oh, they're not producing anything, but aren't they beautiful? These are some of the most beautiful vines you've ever seen. You'd look at him like he was absolutely crazy. Why is that? The purpose of a vine, the purpose of a vineyard is what? To produce fruit. No vineyard owner ever plants, grows, prunes, and cares for vines so that they will just look beautiful. No. A vine has one responsibility, and the responsibility of that vine is to produce fruit. Let me show you a picture. So that's a picture of a tree at our house. I've talked about this tree before. So somebody, I'm not sure whether he's here today, about six years ago, somebody gave us this tree. Nice little tree. It was about, about, about this big, all right? And we went outside, and well, Vicky went outside and planted it, <laughs> all right? Let's be honest. Vicky went outside and planted it. That was about six years ago, and that tree's probably, what, 15 feet now, 15, 20 feet? I mean, you look at it, it's an absolutely beautiful tree. There's one problem with that tree, just one problem. It's a mango tree. In six years, that stinking tree hasn't produced one single mango. Not, not even half a mango. Not even a mango seed. It looks beautiful, but it's not producing anything. Absolutely nothing. We have to have some of you, and thank you for the graciousness of some people here, who bring us the mangoes from their trees because our tree doesn't produce any mangoes. Now, I know some of you are going to come up, somebody's going to come up and say, Brian, here's the issue. We had somebody come up and tell us not long ago. There are male trees and female trees. And you got a male tree, all right? I'm not sure whether we got a male tree or a female. I'm not even sure how you check whether it's a male tree or a female tree. I'm not sure how you do that. I just know that we got a mango tree that isn't producing mangoes. And at some point, we're going to have to take, we're going to have to cut it down because it's not doing its job. Jesus strongly makes the exact same point in this chapter. Notice verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you is the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Here's what Jesus is saying. A a fruitless Christian is just like a fruitless vine. A fruitless Christian is just like the Burkholder's mango tree. It is not doing what it is intended to do. Catch this, church. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you've been redeemed, you have been forgiven. You have been gifted. You have been given the indwelling Holy Spirit of God who is with you. God has given you blessings far beyond what you and I could ever, ever, ever deserve. If we lived a thousand lifetimes, we could never deserve the blessings that God has given us. He's redeemed us. He's forgiven us. He's gifted us for a purpose. And that purpose is to produce You say, Brian, what does that look like? Let me give you two things. I don't think they're in your outline. The first is this. He talks about the fruit that the Holy Spirit of God produces in us. In Galatians, we find a list of the kinds of fruit that the Holy Spirit desires to produce in us. Let me show you this list. Ephesians chapter 5, you know it. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. Ephesians 5 verse 22. 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the things that the Holy Spirit of God wants to produce in me, and he wants to produce in you. That's what he, he's in there for the purpose of producing that fruit in you. There's the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces through us, not only in us, but through us. Matthew 4, 19, follow me, Jesus says, and I will make you fishers of men. In other words, disciples produce disciples. Mangoes produce mangoes. Corn produces corn. Bananas produce banana. You get it, right? All right? You get it. Disciples produce disciples. Jesus said, if you abide in me and I, my words abide in you, you will produce fruit. And if you don't produce fruit, I'm going to cut you down. Or I'm going to trim you away so that you can produce more fruit. So, so let, me, let me pause there for a second because here's what I wrote in my notes. Wait for a second. Please, please, please Listen to me. I'm afraid that at this point, we as pastors have erred. Because we have defined fruit erroneously as a list of tasks that we are to perform. As a believer, if I asked you today, what are the responsibilities of a believer? You would say, go to church on Sunday, and you're here. What are the responsibilities of a believer? Serve one another, and we do. What are the responsibilities of a believer? Give, and you do. What are the responsibilities of a believer? To share our faith with others, and you do that. We as pastors have simply characterized the Christian life this way. Do, 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 do. Do this if you want to be a good Christian. Do this if you want to be a good Christian. Do this if you want to be a good Christian. And all of those things are good, and you should be doing all of those things. But notice in John chapter 15, Jesus doesn't tell us to do anything. He doesn't say if you want to bear fruit, go to church. If you want to bear fruit, get involved in a ministry. If you want to bear fruit, give. If you want to bear fruit, he doesn't say anything. He says, if you want to bear fruit, there's one simple thing that you do. He says, abide in me. Abide in me. Here's the key. We want to produce fruit, but it's not our job to produce fruit. Fruit is produced. He produces the fruit as we abide in him. So think about that again. He produces the fruit. I don't produce the fruit. I don't grow Hollywood Community Church. You don't reach your neighbors for Christ. You don't do this. You don't do that. Now, now, should we be involved in sharing our faith? Absolutely. Should we be serving? Absolutely. We should be doing all of those things. But it's not us who accomplishes anything. It's him who accomplishes it through us as we what? As we abide in. So, so, so catch this, church. Please, please, please catch this. A fruitless life proves one thing. It doesn't prove that you're not serving. It doesn't prove that you don't love your church. A fruitless life doesn't prove that you wanna, don't want to change the world. A fruitless life proves one thing. It proves that you are not connected to the vine. It proves that you are disconnected from the vine because Jesus says if you abide in me you will produce fruit are you struggling with the same sin over and over and over again connect to the vine do you want to reach your kids for Christ connect to the vine do you want to make a difference in the city of Hollywood connect to the vine you want to overflow this auditorium with new believers? Connect to the vine. Jesus says if you want to produce fruit, you got to be connected to me. 
Because separated from me, you cannot do anything. Church, I'm just afraid that we have congregations filled with well-intentioned, disconnected people who are wanting to make a difference in our world. And we're trying, and we're trying, and we're frustrated, and we're wondering why we're not making a difference when we're dried up, withered branches that have disconnected from the vine. Jesus says, connect to me and you will produce fruit. Let me show you one more thing. Okay, I know I'm going just a tad long. Let me show you one more thing. Notice the third thing. To be connected to the vine means that you allow God to trim away the parts of your life that make you fruitless. To to be connected to the vine means that you're going to allow the vine dresser to trim away the parts of your life that cause you to be fruitless. Here's what he says in verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, even those that are bearing fruit, he does what? He prunes it. He trims it. Why? So that it will produce more fruit. Pruning, if you're not familiar, pruning, pruning is the process of cutting away dead or overgrown branches or stems to promote what? To promote healthy plant growth. It is the elimination of anything that hinders the plant from being fruitful. So God says, listen, I have such a strong desire for you that you produce fruit that I am going to prune away. I'm going to trim away anything that is going to keep you from being productive. Does it hurt to be pruned? I'm not a tree, so I don't know. I've never, I've never, I've never actually been cut, but I would think that it does. Pruning involves cutting. I got, a, I got a pruning thing here. So, 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 so this is what, listen, you got something in your life that needs cut away, I'll be right down front. I'm ready to go afterward. Listen, pruning involves God looking at your life and mine and saying, that's not helping you be fruitful. I'm going to cut that away. And that's not helping you be but God, I, I like that. That's a part of me. That's going to hurt. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's going to hurt, but I've got to eliminate it because I've got a greater purpose for your life. And my purpose is that you be fruitful. Let me ask you today, what is it, church? What is it that is hindering you from producing fruit? Would you just sit, sit and think for a minute? Allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to you because right now he's talking to you as you've spoken to me. What is it in your life that is hindering you from producing fruit? What is it in your life that impedes or instruct or obstructs you from being fruitful? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's somebody in your life that is pulling you away from Jesus, not towards Jesus. Maybe it's a habit, something that you do you don't want to do, but it's just this habit that's taken place in your life, and this habit controls you more than Jesus controls you. Maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's spiritual laziness on your part. Maybe it's social media. So what are you talking about? Well, maybe you've been on social media ever since you've been in the auditorium today, and God can't speak to you because you've got your face glued to Facebook on a regular basis. Listen, I have no idea what it is, but I do know that God wants to take his divine, whatever this is, divine, what is this called, Vicki? Cutters. God wants to take his divine pruner, his divine cutters, and he wants to cut that away from your life. Listen, church, even though it's painful for you, it is a loving act of God. Because God has your best interests in mind. You say, Brian, how how do I know what that is? Here's what the psalmist said, Psalm 139. Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. And I promise you this, if you ask God to show you what needs to be pruned, he will show you. I promise he will. So here's the point, church, one point today. Here's the point, catch this. Your most important task 
every single day is to maintain your connection with Jesus. The most important thing you do every day of your life is to maintain your connection to Jesus. Why is that? Because disconnected from him, you wither up. Disconnected from him, you dry up. Disconnected from him, you're unproductive and you don't produce as Stephen and the team comes, I've taken too long. Let me give you three words. I want you to write these three words down in your notes. You say, Brian, okay, practically, what does it mean to abide? Let me give you three words. The first is this, recognition. Recognition. What I mean by that is recognize his presence in your life. He's there. You, you don't have to ask him to come. He is with you. He has promised to never leave you or forsake you. You must simply recognize his presence every single day. In our church in Mexico, we, we worked with uh, upper class people, and Mexican people have a habit of having these eloquent prayers. They would start out, Nuestro Padre que está en los cielos, bendito sea tu nombre. They had these fantastic prayers. And we reached this guy for Christ named Beto. Beto was very simple had like a fourth grade education. Beto, Beto would stand up and pray this way. He would say, buenos dias, senor. And people would be like, no, 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 no. You got to say it this way. Bendito say. Be Beto's like, no. Good morning, Lord. Here's what Beto did. He recognized God's presence in his life. Don't go a day without recognizing God's presence in your life. He's there. You might not know he's there, but he's there. And he wants to work in your life. Recognition. The second word is submission. Submission. Submit and surrender yourself to him every single day. Start off your day saying, God, not my will, but yours be done. May your will be lived out through my life. Whatever it is, whether I like it or whether I don't like it, may your will be done. May your will flow from the vine through the branches through me. And the last is this, communication. Communicate with him. If you'll recognize his presence, if you'll surrender to him, and you will maintain communication with you, listen, he will produce fruit. It's not that he might. He will produce fruit. You say, Brian, how do you know he will? Because that's what the vine does. The vine produces fruit. Jesus says, abide in me. Abide in me. Let my words abide in you. And if you do that, you will produce fruits. Let's stand together. Lord, thank you so much for the truth of the word. Help us to stay connected to the vine. Help us to know that's where victory is. That's where joy is. That's where satisfaction is. That's where empowerment is. That's where strength comes from. Help us to stay connected to you. And as we stay connected to you, May you produce fruit through us, and it's in Jesus' name we pray.